Hello, everyone. My name is Ryan Stone. I've been a FreeBSD committer for over 10 years now. Today, I'd like to talk about my work on what I call SysUnit, which is an infrastructure for doing unit testing in the, for the FreeBSD kernel. So today, I'll give a brief overview of what unit testing is, uh, why I believe that we really need it. And then we'll start walking through some really simple sample unit tests. Um, they're not necessarily tests I would think we want to write, but because they're so simple, but they're simple enough that we can walk through it on a single slide and you can get an idea of the concepts behind uh, writing a unit test. And as we go through these different tests, we'll mostly be talking about what are called test doubles, which are replacements in unit testing. That's a replacement for an, an API specifically for your test and how the, the facilities that SysUnit is going to give you to write your uh, test doubles. So a unit test, if you're not familiar with the concept, it's taking a very small unit of code and testing it in an isolated environment. So that's very abstract. Let's really, what does this mean for FreeBSD? So you're gonna take a little piece of kernel code, you're gonna compile it into a user land object, link it into a user land executable, and that executable will run tests against your code. Uh, any kernel programming interfaces that your kernel code depended on are going to be replaced by test doubles. Uh, those are, again, versions written specifically for unit testing. And so because we have taken this piece of kernel code outside of the kernel, because we've taken the, away the normal KPIs and replaced them with test versions, we can really eliminate dependencies on hardware or special kernel facilities. And again, we get an the, the test is isolated from everything else. So, and this, this slide just tries to emphasize that. We have our unit test here, which is just some C++ code that's going to execute tests. It calls into some kernel, some kernel file that you have compiled for user land and, and linked into this executable. And then any KPIs that that kernel file depended on will uh, have been replaced by these, these KPI doubles. And this is all happening in the context of a single process, all happening in user land. There's no interactions with the kernel at all, other than doing normal system calls, like write, if there's a failure and it has to tell you about a failure, it's gonna write that to standard, to standard error. But there's no, there's no special kernel facilities involved in executing this test. So the main benefit, one of the main benefits we're gonna get out of this is an extremely fast test cycle. You do not need to boot a kernel. You don't need to, uh, you, you just, you know, you, you, you write your, you make, you make your modifications, compile a, compile a test, which takes seconds, and you can immediately run it on the same system, potentially you're, you're writing your code on. So you don't have any dependencies on separate hardware, separate VMs. You you know you don't you don't need you don't need a uh, a machine with a special NIC uh, that that potentially you're trying to test a driver for. All all of that is removed. And then because this test is the environment that this that the kernel code is running under is completely under our control, and is isolated from the rest of the system you can start injecting failures into that code. So you can make weird kernel API failures uh, appear and, see, and test how the, the kernel code is going to react to those failures. And this is, this is very powerful because with you know, a normal system test, if you wanna see, well, how is this, how is this kernel code going to react? if malloc fails one in a million on the on the third allocation it's very hard to actually get that specificity 
in a system test because the malloc implementation isn't just supporting the kernel code that you're testing, it's supporting the entire system. But by running this, your, your kernel code under test, by running that in a user land executable outside of the kernel, now we have complete control. Now we can make failures happen. And we don't have to worry about any weird interactions with the rest of the system. You also get access to any and all visual and debugging tools that you're used to. You can run this executable in GDB and single step through if you want. Now, sometimes you can do that with the kernel, but generally single stepping through kernel code is pretty painful. Uh, but when it's a single threaded usual end test executable, it's trivial. And one of the last benefits is that it's a lot easier to locate regressions and therefore root cause them. Because you're taking such a small piece of kernel code and testing it, if the test is failing, you know that the failure is located, you know, localized to a single function or maybe a single file. If we go back to this diagram, if, if this particular unit test is seeing failures, well, we know the, the, the error has to be in this kern foo file because we don't have any of the rest of the kernel here. Module bugs, of course, say in the test or in the KPI doubles, but if we're confident in those, then we know the errors here. And that's pretty powerful compared to, well, I got some weird memory corruption while testing the kernel, but where did it come from, right? You have no idea. But does this mean that we can replace system tests entirely? And of course not. Unit tests just complement our existing testing infrastructure. It gives us new ways to find bugs and ways to find bugs that previously were very hard for us to find. But it absolutely does not serve as a substitute for testing the full kernel. Because in our unit tests, we're going to have, uh, again, only a single file. So if there's any bugs in the interactions between that file and you know, another kernel API, the unit test may find it. It may not find it. If there's a race condition, well, your unit test is hopefully single threaded. So you're not going to find race conditions that likely through a system unit test. If in writing your kernel code, you misunderstood how an API worked, a kernel API worked, and then you baked that misunderstanding into one of the test doubles you wrote for your test, well, your test will pass because the, 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 the test double works the way you, you thought it did. And the kernel code is depending on that on the code working in that way. But when you actually go and run it on a real kernel and you're running against the actual KPI, which doesn't work the way you thought it did, that's the point where the bug shows up. So again, not a panacea, but it does allow us to write new tests in interesting ways. So uh, in, my, uh, in my branch, I've added a sysunit directory under test sys, where all uh, sysunit tests are gonna go. And I have chosen Google test, which is a C++ uh, library for uh, and framework for writing tests. And I know that the choice of C++ for testing a C, project like the kernel might be a little controversial. So let's talk about why I made that choice. So the first reason is that G-Test really has become the industry standard over the last few years for writing unit tests for C and especially C++ code. There are of course other libraries but they're nowhere near as popular. They're nowhere, near, they're nowhere near as well, like documented in the community. Uh, 
and they don't necessarily have the same level of support and they don't necessarily have the same level of ongoing development that G-Test does. The, the second reason I chose it is that G-Test is already in the source tree. So we already have two test frameworks in our tree, at least. Uh, I don't see a reason to add another one. So let's make use of what's already there. And I said there's at least two. I know that we also have ATF, and ATF is a little more C-focused. But in my experience writing ATF tests, I, I really don't think that it is a viable test framework. I have a lot of problems with its, that are inherent to its design. And I have a lot of problems with the ergonomics of the API. I don't think that it's easy to write tests in ATF. I don't think it's easy to, to debug tests in ATF. And I don't think that it's just a, a very good test framework going forward for us. Something else we get for, from G-Test is uh, we get out of the box integration with Google Mock, which is one library for writing the test doubles I, I've mentioned before. And we'll get into more of that in, as we go forward. And lastly, the C++ API that G-Test has, I actually find that when you get used to it, your tests are simpler to write and more intuitive to read. To a C programmer, I know there will be a learning curve as you, because C++ syntax can get a little hairy, but I really do believe that it enables us to write tests that are, that are actually readable uh, as opposed to just a whole lot of C calls that as if you try to read, read through, you know, 20 C calls in a row that are setting up your test, you're just, I think you just lose track of what's actually happening in the noise. And G-Test, I find it's a little more natural to read. So let's start with our very first test. Let's test sys, sys control context net. Uh, as you can see, I put the, the source code for it on the left-hand side of the slide. It's a very simple function. If we were given a null pointer, we'll give you an error. Otherwise, initialize the context list and it's a, under the hood, it's actually just a tail kit. So here's, here's how we can write a test for that. We'll start off with our, our, includes, our includes. There's not too much to note there other than keep in mind that your test being, as we just spoke of, it's a C++ test and the kernel headers are for C. So you need to wrap the headers in begin decals and decals. So you get the external C wrapping around it and it actually, uh, the, the linkage is correct. Uh, you need to create a, a class. It looks a little useless here. Uh, in a more complicated test, it might actually do a little bit more. But just creating this, this test suite class and inheriting from the sysunit test suite super class that I, I, I provide, you will actually get a fair amount of behind the scenes test analyzation happening for you. For example, if any of the code you've linked in, whether it's from a test double or from the code you're actually testing, if there are any sysunits in that code, then those will be run for you before the, the, uh, the test run so runs. And therefore you don't have to worry about, well, is all the state of this, of this code actually initialized for me or do I have to somehow figure out how to do it? No, it's all done for you. And there are some other things that, that inheriting from test suite will just get you out of the box. So I really do recommend that just every test inherits from this. And now we just have a very standard uh, G-Test test. I'm not gonna belabor the, the specifics to the G-Test API too much. We have this test function macro or test, I think that's what the F stands for. Uh, you give it the name of the test suite, uh, the, which is the class we just declared, and then just any name for the test, it's arbitrary. 
and now just write some C code that it invokes the code you want to test and checks that it's doing what you expect. So in this case, we'll call syscontrol context net and we'll check that we didn't get an error from that call. And we'll check that the tail queue was indeed initialized. And then we'll do a second call with null and check that we'll get the eval back. So this isn't, in this case, it's not really all that different from what you would get if you had written an ATF test. It's as the tests get more complicated that the difference between the two, I think really starts to show. But before we move on, I, I, one issue I wanna bring up in everyone's minds is when you're writing tests, you have to consider, am I writing a good test? And what's a good, so some of the questions that I would, I would have if I had seen this, this test in a code review is, do consumers of Sys control context in Nix actually care that this context list under the hood is a tail key? Because we've embedded that assumption in our test by calling tail key empty. But if you actually look at a consumer of Sys control context in it, they would never do that. They don't, they don't care about the fact that under the hood, this is just a list from SysQ. They care that they can pass this context to other syscontrol functions and they'll, they'll act on them. So I would argue that this, this test may not be the, the, the best thing to actually write because you're very much tying this test to the implementation of a context list. And the problem with that is that if somebody goes out and makes a change to syscontrol and say, Instead of just a normal tail queue, it becomes a concurrent list of some kind. Now this test can't even compile. And okay, yeah, they can come in and they can change, they can change the test pretty easily and fix it. It's not that hard. But I think that it does point out an issue with the test that it is very tied to the internals of syscontrol context. And you, you, you do need to be careful about whether that is really a part of the API that you that you care to test. Now, in, in some cases, you really do want to you really do want to test the internals because you have some hairy, you know, static function or some hairy logic under the hood that you're really not sure about. You want to make sure that your your data structures are staying sane. Like say you have a self-balancing binary tree, like a red-black tree, and you're writing a test for that. Well, the, con the consumer of a, of a red-black tree isn't going to care about, well, is the red-black invariance holding as I modify this list? But in that case, I think a unit test that actually did check the, that the red-black tree was always in a valid state for a red-black tree after every operation, that's probably a valid thing to check because it is it is a tricky thing to get right. Uh, it's difficult to test outside of a unit test where you have access to these internals. And even though clients don't care about that particular detail, they do care about the detail that your red black tree is giving them the guaranteed performance of a red black tree. And you only guarantee that performance that, uh, you only guarantee that performance by maintaining the invariance of the of the data structure. So there's there's always that trade-off to be made when writing a unit test. If you go too deep into the implementation details, uh, any changes to the implementation require changes to the test. And that makes the tests a little less valuable because they're, they're breaking so often. But on the flip side, it also lets you check things that consumers don't know about, but that are actually crucial to the functionality. So just something you have to keep in mind. So on the left-hand side, this is just a make file that would build this test for us. There's nothing all that complicated here, include some .make files, tell the test infrastructure where it should place the tests via the tester variable. 
uh, SysUnit tests, you just have a list of names of tests. It's very similar to say progs, or I think you've had tests uh, for ATF before. I do recommend uh, at least writing your tests for C++17. You don't really lose anything from going to C++17 and you do gain some nice features. So I've written all my tests with C++17. And then you list the sources. So in this case, the syscontrol.cc is just a test file we have on the right hand side. And then there's a separate case sources variable. So this is for any kernel sources you want to compile and link it to the test. In this case, we're testing the syscontrol implementation. So we're linking in current syscontrol.c and we have to set this dot path so that the make knows where to find current syscontrol in syscurrent. I don't set that automatically for you because you might be trying to test a file out or, uh, you know, dev or net or what have you. So you know where the file is. So you tell, you tell, uh, you tell the build infrastructure where to find it. But if you go to build it, this is the, uh, this is what's going to happen. At link time, you're going to get a million link failures for KPIs that current syscontrol.c depended on. And you'll note that if we go back to the actual implementation of syscontrol context in it, it never used any of these KPIs. But because other functions in the same .c file do, when you link it together, even though you don't use those symbols, they still get pulled in. So this is a case where we start to need what I've been calling test doubles, replacements for these kernel APIs so that our tests can link. And this is a great example of a case for you. Actually, getting ahead of myself. So test doubles. We just saw kernel code depends on a lot of APIs, so we need replacements for them. Now, there are different types of test doubles and as basically anything in naming and programming, people don't always agree on the definitions. These are the definitions that I have been using in SysUnit, and I think they're pretty reasonable ones that are easy to understand. So three there are these three types of test doubles. We have stubs, we have fakes, and we have mocks. A stub, it's a test double where the behavior is always the same, and we'll get into why you'd want that. A fake is probably what should be the most common type in your tests. Uh, and technically I define it as it's a test double whose behavior changes based on the function parameters. More practically, it's just a scaled down or maybe not even a scaled down. Maybe it's a full re-implementation of the, the API. And finally, a mock, that's the test double where the behavior is programmable by the unit test. So the unit test gets to specify exactly what the double is going to, be, going to do. So when we get to mocks, we'll dig a little more into what that means. So stubs seem kind of strange at first. Why would you ever write a replacement for an API and the behavior never changes? Well, this is where we get back to this previous case. Uh, we have all these functions that we don't actually ever get invoked during our test. In that case, if you're only trying to get the, the program to link or the test to link, a stub is great because just, just, give, just give the symbol so the linker is happy and move on. And so in cases like this, where you're just trying to get it to link, and writing a stub, I recommend actually just having that function abort if it ever gets called. Because that way, if you're wrong and your test is invoking the function when you didn't expect it to, it means that you very quickly get notified that, hey, you had an unwarranted assumption, you need to revisit this. Because if you just, for example, you know, return zero from copy in, then that's going to give a very, that's going to cause a lot of confusion in your test you know, the, the code that you're testing will call copy in, nothing will happen, but it won't get an error and it'll continue on. And you'll probably spend quite a while trying to figure out why 
your 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 copy and calls are doing nothing until you finally realize, oh shoot, that was my fault. I linked in a stub. Now, that's not the only case to use a stub. There can be cases where you expect it to be called, but you don't actually care. So you just, you know, return zero, return success and move on. And that's valid. Just be wary of it because if the function is being called, presumably it's important to the operation of the kernel code you're testing. And if that's important, then you should probably want to validate that it's getting used correctly. But moving on, here's a, here's a second uh, syscontrol function that we'd like to write test for. Syscontrol handle length. And to recap this for anybody who forgets, you will pass on an integer argument to syscontrol handle int, and it will do two things. It will write the current value of that integer argument you passed to whoever invoked the syscontrol, so they get that value. And also, if the caller of the syscontrol gave us a new value, it will overwrite what you passed with that new value. In this particular case, we're going to ignore the write, so the incoming, the incoming, and only worry about copying out the current data, just for the simplicity of the test. So here's our first attempt. We'll create a, a faked up, or maybe we shouldn't call it fake, just uh, a, a substitute OID and rec struct, so we have something to pass. We'll call system control handle int. But okay, so we're expecting expecting system control handle in to copy our source variable somewhere, and we need to be able to test that that copying happened correctly. And if you look at the implementation, well, it's going to call this old func pointer in the rec struct. So if we just were to run this, ignoring the question marks, uh, it would just crash because we haven't applied that that function. Uh, and so we need so we need to resolve this. We our our test code has a dependency on a kernel API. We need to provide a, a a version of it. And here a stub will not do because we need to we're actually going to invoke it. And we want to make sure that it's being invoked correctly. We want to make sure that when syscontrol handle int is called, that it will actually copy our this variable source, the value in that variable out to our caller. So this is where we start, this is where you would consider a fake. <clears throat> so fakes uh, are gonna go in this syslib, sysunit fake directory. I have a lot of them written already, but we have a lot of KPIs, we're gonna need more. So if you write one, please put it there so other people can find it. And just to recap, a fake is just a, a, a coded implementation of, of the, the API. So prefer a fake in cases where you just need an implementation that, that works. And I, I, <laughs> that phrasing is awkward. When you, when you have an implementation that you always want to succeed and do the right thing, so this isn't an this isn't generally something you want to use if you want to test failure cases from the API because that gets a little awkward. So generally, you're, you're writing fakes for the happy path, not not for the error path. And when you're writing your fake uh, a fake library for a KPI, uh, absolutely, if it's viable, just compile the kernel implementation and link it into your library. Like don't even copy and paste it. I mean, literally take the C file uh, just the way we did for the linking to the test, only you're linking and making it, making it your library instead. Uh, because using the original implementation is best because you can never run into that case of, oops, I misunderstood how the API actually works and what I implemented doesn't match the real implementation because you're actually using the real implementation. Uh, that's honestly the best case scenario. But 
the reason why you'll frequently find you can't is the actual implementation will have further dependencies on other KPIs and those KPIs will depend on more KPIs and you can sort of get this exponential explosion of KPIs that you uh, depend on and you wind up compiling half the kernel into your into your executable and now we've really missed the point of having an isolated test with a very small amount of, of the kernel code in it. So as with everything in, in writing unit tests, there's, there's always a balance that has to be struck in between trying to use the real implementations because it's both safer and easier, but keeping our dependencies at a manageable level. So uh, I, I've left the system control implementation up on the left just for reference, but on the right, we have a very simple fake. It takes the, the three arguments that the old funk requires, rec, source, and len, and just use memcopy, right? That's all we need. We just need to get the, the argument, uh, the value in the argument accessible to our caller. And then in this case, because the test passes this rectstruct down and the rectstruct uh, defines what function should be called via a function pointer, it, it's very easy to just set that function pointer and pass it in and everything just works. This isn't usually the case. Uh, you know, we saw previously copy in. If, if syscontrol handling directly called copy copy in or copy out, then it would be, you know, referencing this, this C symbol copy out. And in that case, all you have to do is just provide an implementation of that symbol. So you would literally write, you know, static in, or not static in, just int copy out and let the linker uh, handle that. The linker will just locate that and link it in. But in this case, it's, you know, not by symbol name, it's by a function pointer. So we set the function pointer here. Uh, we set the pointer value we're gonna use. And then we call syscontrol handle int a couple times. And we test both times that we didn't get an error and that the fetched value, this int we've declared on the stack that copy in will, or sorry, fake old function will copy copy into just to test that we indeed got the value we expected that it matches the source. Now, one thing I'll point out is that this fake is overly simplified. The real old func function pointers need to be able to handle multiple calls in sequence and to you know, walk forward byte by byte so that if you wrote three bytes followed by one byte, the first call would write to the first three bytes of the pointer and the second call would write to the fourth byte. Uh, but just for simplicity sake and the fact that we didn't need it, I, I didn't bother trying to implement that. But there would be a danger here that say someone tries to reuse this fake for another syscontrol handler test where that behavior is required. And now you've run into a case where your test double doesn't match the real implementation and you're going to see bizarre behavior because of that. And lastly, I promised 20 minutes or so ago or so that you could use uh, unit testing to test error paths easily. So for example, if you want to test what happens, what does this syscontrol handle and do if syscontrol out fails? And so here's one thing we can do. In this case, it, the, we could declare uh, this global variable and then if it's set, just return the error and then we can set this global variable in our error path test. 
And you know what? That would work. Uh, but, and for this particular test, probably, yeah, go for it. But as the logic behind when to return the error gets more complicated, if you want the third malloc call to, to fail, if you want an API to fail immediately after a particular different API call, if there's some kind of order and you're trying to enforce, uh, the logic you have to write here gets complicated. And it's all bespoke. Like every time you write a fake, you'll have to, and you need that type of conditional error behavior, you'd have to re-implement it from scratch. And the more complicated the logic is, the more arcane your test is going to be. You'll be setting all these weird global variables to strange values. And I don't think it'll be very easy to read. So ideally, we would like to get away from causing errors through writing, writing code in our fakes. And this is where mocks come in. So mocks, as I, as I said before, offer programmable behavior. So it's, it's a configurable object. So in Google mock, which is the mocking library I've chosen, you can say validate function parameters, make sure that we got past the things we wanted to get past, uh, enforce ordering between calls, return values you've already determined. There's all kinds of functionality. And Google Mock, it's already in the base system along with Google Tests, so that's nice and easy. And then the actual individual mock implementations will go in the syslib mock directory. Again, if you're writing a mock, other people are probably going to end up wanting to use the same kernel APIs in their tests. So by putting them, putting the mocks in a shared location, everybody can benefit. So one of the downsides of Google Mock is, especially to a C programmer, the syntax is going to be a little arcane, and you just sort of have to suck it up and deal with it. Uh, I've written the actual mock on the left-hand side. So, and uh, another problem with Google mock is that it's a very C++ focused API. So it's used to mock virtual functions in a, in a class, which obviously does not apply to anything we're writing in C. Fortunately, with a little bit of boilerplate, we can make our C APIs conform to what they expect. So I have written this global, global mock header that handles a lot of the boilerplate at a time. So this is, believe it or not, the reduced version. <laughs> but so what you have to do if you want to write a mock is you, you uh, declare a class and you inherit from global mock, and this is a template, and the template argument is the same type you just declaring here. And to again do a C programmer, it looks weird to a C programmer. To it's that's a very unusual thing. Uh, I'm not going to get into why it's it, just 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 do it. <laughs> it. There's some template magic happening under the hood that's really not relevant to anybody who needs to write a mock just to any you would ever have to change the global mock code, but hopefully we don't have to do that very often. And then you can declare a mock method. The three in mock method means I have three arguments. Uh, you give the name of the function, so, or, or the method, I guess, old func, and then you give the type signature. So it returns an int and accepts these three arguments, rec, source, and len with the given types. And then we have to declare this uh, global variable, just copy and paste it. Uh, but this is just declaring a global, a, a global object whose constructor will run 
as the the uh, as the executable loads, and it will register itself, register the existence of this mock with sysunit, and it will become available to you. And then finally, we, we just declare this mock old func function, which accepts whatever arguments you choose. And then, so we just get this static mock ob uh, object out of the, the class we've written and call the old func method on it with the, our parameters. So I'll admit this syntax is a little arcane, but you get used to it, it's not that bad, and you can pretty much copy and paste and just change the arguments and the names as needed, and that's all you have to do. And then in our test, again, we'll set up rec old func, but now we're gonna our, we're going to pass a pointer to this mock old func we have just written. And we will tell gmock, expect a call to a method on this object, which is the same object we have here. Here's the method we expect to get called. And these are the parameters to expect. So the first parameter needs to match rec. So we'll just, it'll just match that pointer. We don't care about what the value of the second one is. And the third one should be size of it. You should expect exactly one call. When you get called, return eFault. And then this retires on saturation as an internal GMOC thing saying, forget that this expectation, forget all about this. Uh, once this happens, the first, once this has happened, the number of times I specified, uh, it's not really necessary here. If you set up multiple expectations on a, for the same method on the same object, uh, they can sort of interfere with each other if an older one can match a newer call. So this tells it to, to get rid of the older one once it's been used so that the, the newer one can, can match. And then again, we call this control handle int and we expect to get this eFault error that should have been returned from this function here, which if we go back to here, uh, the error will be returned out of this, this function pointer call in syscontrol out. The error will go here. The error will be uh, will come will be you know propagate out through this if if and oh dear oh, no. oh you're not being helpful okay sorry about that <laughs> apparently if I scroll too far I just get kicked out of the slideshow very helpful. Uh, but so the, the return value will, will come here and we're testing it. So that's, that's the flow of how all that, all that worked. So again, in a case like this, I, this may be looking like overkill, like, do I really need all of this just to return an error from a function? Probably not, but I have to give very simple examples that will fit on one slide. So bear with me, as you try to do anything more complicated, I think you will find that mocks are extremely helpful. So where am I at with this? I opened up a set of reviews a little while back. Uh, I honestly let it get sort of caught up in a bit of a, uh, in a bike shed and I haven't had, I haven't pushed through that, I need to. I have one set of te sample tests read. So, I mean, if you wanna ask what's next, we need more tests. If you'd like to help, please get in contact with me. Uh, and I need, to get, I need to get what I have upstream into FreeBSD so it's a lot easier for people to write tests rather than having to, to clone my branch. But I, have a, I do have a branch on GitHub if you'd like to see it. Uh, and there's a little bit of documentation I put on the wiki that it's about a year old, so I haven't updated it, which is why I haven't linked it here. 
but I do intend on getting that up to date. That's pretty much it. I um, guess I'm right on time. Uh, Dan, are we gonna be doing questions? Don't even know if Dan can hear me. He might be uh, doing three streams at once right now. Okay. Well, un unfortunately, because I'm on a Windows machine, if you've put questions in IRC, I'm afraid I can't see them. I don't have an IRC client on this. So I guess I'll have to call it here. So thank you for attending or thank you for watching. Uh, and uh, have a good day, everybody.